What's that? The major feature of acute leukemia is uncontrolled neoplastic proliferation of blast, which results in accumulation of more than 20% of blast cells in the bone marrow. Exactly presence of more than 20% of blast cells in the bone marrow we call acute leukemia. The problem is that blast cells are so aggressive that they begin to crowd out all normal cells from the bone marrow, which results in anemia, thrombocytopenia and neutropenia. Blast cells belong to white blood cells. So with accumulation of blast cells in the bone marrow, they begin to leak into the bloodstream, which results in elevation of white blood cell count. These features are the same for all types of acute leukemia. And recall that we have two major subtypes of acute leukemia. It's acute lymphoblastic leukemia and acute myelogenous leukemia. To explain the pathogenesis of acute leukemia, we have to recall normal hematopoiesis. Alright, you like this. Recall that hematopoiesis can be subdivided on myelopoiesis and lymphopoiesis. The final products of lymphopoiesis are B and T lymphocytes. So, in normal condition, to make a mature lymphocyte, stem cells have to undergo differentiation into common lymphoid progenitor cell, and then progenitor cell undergo further differentiation into lymphoblast. Lymphoblast mature into prolymphocyte, and from prolymphocyte we make B and T lymphocytes. In acute lymphoblastic leukemia, mutation occurs, which disrupts normal maturation of lymphoblast. The first consequence is accumulation of blast cells, and when the quantity of blast cells becomes greater than 20% of all cells in the bone marrow, we call this state acute leukemia. The second consequence is decrease in formation of mature lymphocytes, and as we know, with decrease in lymphocytes, the risk of viral infection increase, and eventually changes in the bone marrow will also cause changes in blood analysis. Here we can see a typical blood analysis of a patient with acute leukemia. Here we can see a very high white blood cell count, and this elevation of white blood cells caused by accumulation of blood cells. Also we can see decrease in lymphocyte count due to the disruption of maturation. So, to summarize this step in pathogenesis, acute lymphoblastic leukemia causes accumulation of blood cells. In addition to this, in acute leukemia, mutation disrupts maturation of lymphocytes, which results in decrease in lymphocyte count, this state we call lymphopenia, and lymphopenia greatly increases the risk of viral infection. Another problem with blood cells is that they are very large and aggressive cells. They proliferate rapidly, and because of this, they very rapidly invade the space inside the bone marrow. This creates a huge problem, because bone marrow is located inside the bone, and bones cannot be distended. So blood cells basically begin to crowd out all other cells from the bone marrow. So to explain this, let's suppose that it's a bone marrow. In normal condition, bone marrow is 100% packed with cells in normal proportions. And in normal condition, lymphoblasts take up no more than 5% from all space in the bone marrow. So other 98% of space is taken by all other cells. It's erythroblast from which we make red blood cells. It's megakaryocytes from which we make platelets. And it's myeloblast from which we make neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, and monocytes. But now, with mutation that disrupts maturation, the amount of lymphoblast increase and becomes 20%, for example. And because bone marrow is already fully packed with cells, there is no free space. And to gain space, blood cells in this state force normal cells to leave the bone marrow. This feature we call bone marrow invasion. As a result, the amount of all other cells in the bone marrow begin to progressively decrease. And very important here is that the higher becomes the quantity of blood cells, the lesser space is left for normal cells, so the higher will be the amount of normal cells that are forced to live. 
as we see eventually this results in Pansite opinion. So, if Lymphoblast will force out all neutrophils precursors, the amount of neutrophils will decrease, and neutropenia greatly increase the risk of bacterial infections. If lymphoblast will force out eosinophilic cells, this will increase the risk of parasitic infections. If monocytic cells will leave the bone marrow, this will increase the risk of bacterial infection. And also, at some point, basophils will also decrease. I don't feel good about this. I don't feel good about what this! you feel good about anything? So, in blood analysis, we see decrease in all fractions of neutrophils, simply because neutrophils are forced to leave the bone marrow due to the blast cells invasion. Also, lymphoblasts crowd out erythroid cells, which results in anemia, and also lymphoblasts crowd out megakaryocytes, which results in thrombocytopenia. So, in blood analysis, we see severe thrombocytopenia due to the blast cells invasion. And also, we see low red blood cells and hemoglobin values, which tell us about anemia. And anemia is also caused by bone marrow invasion by blood cells. So, to summarize, with mutation, lymphoblast invades the bone marrow. And in order to do this, they need to crowd out all normal cells out of the bone marrow. This causes decrease in neutrophils, and neutropenia increases the risk of bacterial infections. Together, lymphopenia and neutropenia increase the risk of fungal infections. Also, lymphoblastic invasion causes decrease in eosinophils that increase the risk of parasitic infections. And also, they cause decrease in monocytes, which increase the risk of bacterial infections. In addition to this, lymphoblastic invasion of the bone marrow causes decrease in red blood cells. And with decrease in red blood cells, hemoglobin decrease, which cause anemic symptoms. Anemia will manifest with weakness, fatigue, shortness of breath during physical exercises. Also, patient with anemia will have a pale skin and conjunctiva. In addition to this, if anemia progress, new symptoms begin to appear. It's lightheadedness, headaches, severe fatigue, shortness of breath even at rest, and irregular heartbeats. Also, lymphoblasts crowd out platelets precursors, which cause thrombocytopenia. And thrombocytopenia causes disruption of primary hemostasis. Disruption of primary hemostasis manifests with increase in bleeding time. Also, it causes bleeding from the mucous membranes, primarily from GI tract, but also frequently they have nose bleeding, so-called epistaxis. And microhemorrhages begin to develop that on skin manifest with patechia purpura chemosis. When lymphoblasts crowd out normal cells from the bone marrow, they cannot just disappear. They have to take a shelter somewhere. So when normal cells are forced to leave the bone marrow, as human beings they come to places that were their homes before the bone marrow. We call them previous sites of hematopoiesis, its spleen, lymph nodes and liver. So, invasion by blood cells of the bone marrow force normal cells to leave the bone marrow, and from the bone marrow, in search for a shelter, cells come back to places that were the sites of hematopoiesis before the bone marrow. Initially, it's splenic tissue, so a lot of cells migrate to a spleen, and with increasing amount of cells in the splenic tissue, the size of the spleen increase and enlargement of the spleen we call splenomegaly. Splenomegaly manifests with abdominal discomfort and early satiety that cause loss of appetite. With abdominal discomfort, everything is clear. Obviously, if patient has enlarged spleen, it will compress anatomical structures nearby and eventually it will cause discomfort. But how to explain loss of appetite? Usually, when we consume some food, this food incomes to the stomach, where food causes pressure on gastric walls, and exactly this pressure of food that causes distension of the gastric walls give us a sense of satiety. But in case of splenomegaly, the larger becomes the spleen, the more it compresses the stomach, 
and the more compressed is the stomach, the smaller becomes the stomach volume. So, in these circumstances, the less amount of food will be needed to increase intragastric pressure, and thereby to cause distension of the gastric walls. So, the lesser food is needed to provoke a sense of satiety. And because of that, patients with splenomegaly have loss of appetite. And obviously, decrease in food consumption potentially can cause decrease in body weight. I think that's the shit, man. Another serious problem is that at some point, spleen becomes so large that a condition called hypersplenism develops. The concept here is that the larger becomes the spleen, the more reactive becomes splenic macrophages. And at some point, enlargement of the spleen causes overstimulation of macrophages. And now they begin to consume by phagocytosis normal red blood cells and platelets, which results in their destruction. So the more severe becomes acute leukemia, the larger becomes the spleen, and thereby the higher is the chance that splenic macrophages will cause rapid and premature destruction of red blood cells and platelets. So hypersplenism can cause destruction of red blood cells and platelets that aggravates anemia and thrombocytopenia that are already present. What? Also, a lot of cells migrate to lymph nodes. With increasing quantity of cells inside the lymph nodes, the size of the lymph nodes increase, and enlargement of the multiple lymph nodes throughout the body we call generalized lymphadenopathy. And if spleen and lymph nodes are fully filled with cells, then cells are going into another previous place of hematopoiesis, which is liver. And now they will progressively accumulate also in the liver tissue. So the size of the liver will increase, and enlargement of the liver we call hepatomegaly. Malignant lymphoblasts have their signature feature. We call them leaky or wet blasts. The reason is that they can easily cross through the various barriers. First of all, if they will cross blood-brain barrier, this can cause CNS injury, and we call this state neuroleukemia. Also, lymphoblasts can cross testicular barrier, and in this case, they will infiltrate testes. What? Malignant blood cells are very aggressive and active cells, and such huge amount of blood cells produce massive amount of cytokines that cause B symptoms. It's weight loss, fever, chills, and night sweats. Also, such huge amount of blood cells in the bone marrow put a great amount of pressure on bone tissue, and sometimes it can manifest as bone pain. So that's, that's it then? No one else really knows anything? Okay. Um, what? We have to know that with chemotherapy, there is a possibility that tumor lysis syndrome will develop. Chemotherapy causes death of massive amount of blood cells in a very short period of time. With death, blood cells release their intracellular content into the blood. It's potassium, which causes hyperkalemia, and high potassium level can cause muscle weakness and arrhythmias. Also, they release phosphate, and phosphate in the blood binds calcium. This causes decrease in blood calcium level, which predispose to arrhythmias and seizures. In addition to this, phosphate with calcium form calcium phosphate crystals which can cause acute kidney injury. And the last substance that is released into the blood is uric acid, which can form uric acid crystals. And uric acid crystals can also cause acute kidney injury. You would experience such a shitstorm of consequences, my friend, that your empty little head would be spinning faster than the wheels of your Schwinn bicycle back there. You think that's a Schwinn? No! <laughs> to prevent tumor lysis syndrome, patients should receive massive hydration to wash out this ion disbalance. And also, we should give to a patient allopurinol or resburicase, which will inhibit formation of uric acid. Gents, our hope is restored! 
So, when we look at blood analysis of patient with acute leukemia, the major feature is the presence of blood cells. And to make a diagnosis of acute leukemia, we perform bone marrow aspiration, where we should determine more than 20% of blood cells. But how to say it's acute myeloid leukemia or acute lymphoblastic leukemia? Because blood analysis and bone marrow aspiration in both these disorders will look the same. So, in this case, white blood cell count is 56, and from 56, 54% are blood cells. So, to confirm the diagnosis, we perform bone marrow aspiration, where we should determine more than 20% of blood cells. But how to tell it's acute myeloid leukemia or acute lymphoblastic leukemia? All right, let me explain something to you, Mr. Black. You know who I am, I know who you are. Perhaps. But appearances can be deceptive. Yeah. Acute myeloid leukemia is caused by myeloblast, and acute lymphoblastic leukemia is caused by lymphoblast. So, in order to find out the subtype of leukemia, we have to stain blood cells with a certain specific markers. For lymphoblast, it's TDT, which is DNA polymerase, and also we can use pass reaction, which determines glycogen. These two markers are positive in case of lymphoblast. And the specific marker for lymphoblast is myeloperoxidase. So, if myeloperoxidase is positive and TDT with pass reaction negative, it's acute myeloid leukemia. But if TDT and pass reaction are positive, it's acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So, let's summarize. We got to take care of our immortal souls. You know you can't read. It's the Bible, you get credit for trying. The major feature of acute lymphoblastic leukemia is the accumulation of more than 20% of lymphoblast in the bone marrow. You have to know that if blood cells are higher than normal but less than 20, let's say blood cells on bone marrow aspiration are 15%. We call this condition myelodysplastic syndrome. Have I made myself clear, Baz? Yeah, that's perfectly clear, Mickey, yeah. Just give me one minute to confer with my colleague. Did you understand a single word of what he just said? <laughs> <laughs> to determine lymphoblast, we stain them with two specific markers. It's TDT and pass reaction. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia can affect both adults and children. In contrast to this, acute myeloid leukemia affects only adults. So, if child has acute leukemia, it's with 99% probability acute lymphoblastic leukemia. ALL has two subtypes, B and T. B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia is the most common subtype. Exactly the pathogenesis of BLL we discussed in this video. Recall that lymphoblasts are very leaky cells that can leak through the testicular and blood-brain barrier. We have to know that in order to prevent neural leukemia, we infuse by lumbar punction methotrexate. Well, what did you do that for? Don't know, sir. Also, in some cases, person with acute lymphoblastic leukemia can have Philadelphia chromosome, which is a specific feature of chronic myeloid leukemia. And the presence of Philadelphia chromosome is considered as a very bad prognostic marker. The reason why pH chromosome can complicate ALL is very simple. pH chromosome causes huge stimulation of proliferation. Basically, in this case, it's not just accumulation of blood cells due to the disruption of maturation. It's also very rapid proliferation of blood cells. So, obviously, in this case, leukemia will progress very rapidly. You guys grow better! The major feature of T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia is the growth pattern. T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia is the only subtype that grows as a mass in thymus. It's the reason why we call this leukemia acute lymphoblastic lymphoma. Recall that the size of the thymus decreases with age. So, when enlarged thymus is present in adult, it's very suspicious. 
So when you see blast cells and enlarged thymus, especially in adult, most probably it's acute lymphoblastic lymphoma. What do we learn, Palmer? I don't know, sir. I don't fucking know either.